much more importantly, I'm joined by Joe and Anne today. So, Joe, I know you're really busy and you're in the middle of the emergency services show in Birmingham. Uh, so I really am grateful for you joining us today. And there might be a bit of background noise because you're right in the middle of the conference, aren't you? Do you want to introduce yourself, right. Joe? <laughs> Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Joe Milden Hall. I'm the Paramedic Psychological Wellbeing and Health and Wellbeing Manager for the College of Paramedics. And you're right, I'm in, I'm in the middle of the NEC, so uh, do apologise if there's any background noise or you see people walking behind me, um, but hopefully everything will be fine. Oh, thanks ever so much for joining us, Joe. It's above and beyond the call of duty. Thank you for that. And you're going to talk a little bit about some of the things you're talking about at the conference, which is really nice as well. And we're joined by Anne, uh, Anne Keane. And do you mind introducing yourself? Hi, everybody. So my name is Anne Keane. I'm a professional advisor at the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. And my role is to support our members with any issues they have regarding their practice. And also I support people going through the fitness to practice process with HCPC. Um, and Anne and uh, Joe will be contributing during the session and they're also here to answer your questions. So do pop in chat if you've got any questions specifically for them. Um, we will make sure that, you know, they get passed on to them if that's OK. So let me just go to my first slide. You'll see me looking up the screen, so I do apologise for that. So I just wanted to plug a couple of our events. We are running a series of my HCPC standards. This is one of the series and it's very, very much focused uh, on um, the new standards of proficiency. So we'll talk about those as we go along, but they're up on the screen. And um, Fiona and Patrick will pop the link to the events in chat and you're most welcome to come along to them. Uh, we're also very happy to come to you in person um, to talk about some of these issues. If you work in practice and you have a group of colleagues, a group of um, healthcare professionals, and you want me to come and talk to you, um, I'm very happy to do that. And again, we'll put our email to the professional services um, inbox in chat uh, and we'd be really happy to, to meet you in person. How nice would that be? A little bit of housekeeping. I've already talked about the polling system that we're going to be using today. We'll be using it in a moment. And um, the session is 45 minutes long. We will make sure, you know, we finish on time. And if, you, if you've got another meeting or some time, you can grab a cup of a cup of tea or something between times. Um, I think that's probably all I wanted to say about that. So um, follow us on Twitter. Um, we will be tweeting during the event. Uh, Becky, our social media expert, will be tweeting during the event using the hashtag MyHCPC standards. And if you want to also um, tweet to the emergency services show, uh, take a picture of Jo and say you've seen her, uh, that would be wonderful as well, because I know that there's lots of tweets going on at the emergency services show. Um, so that's that's quite exciting as well. So there we go. That's a little bit about the social media and us. So this is what we're going to do for the next 45 minutes, look a little bit about the role of the HCPC, but I think you've heard me talk about it so many times. Um, so I'm going to briefly whiz through that. We're going to talk about primarily what the new standards of proficiency, um, which have just come out well, about a month ago now, say about our fitness to practice as registrants. Um, we're talking about sharing ideas that focus on well-being and Anne and Joe are going to talk about some of the uh, things that um, in their professional bodies that uh, they, they've got some resources for you. I'm going to look a little bit about other HCPC support for you and your staff. So I hope that you're going to find that useful. So first bit of polling, if you don't mind, how can I lost my phone when I've actually, so I have to turn the polling on by my phone. So I'm literally going to go, um, do you know what, I've just logged out. I can't believe I just logged out of the, uh, I can't believe I just logged out. So I just, when I've literally, logged in and logged out again. So hang on one second, see if it will log me back in in a very quick way. You know, when you just literally fiddle with something on your phone, turn it on, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to not let me log back in in a second. So while Anne and uh, Joe are talking in a minute, I'll log back in and we'll go back to the polls if that's all right. Technology, there you go. So let's talk a little bit about the HCPC, as you know, that we are responsible for public protection quality assuring education, maintaining a register, responding to fitness practice, which Anne's already mentioned, and setting appropriate standards. So we're going to be talking a lot today about the new standards of proficiency because they're the key, really, the new standards of proficiency that we've actually um, just published. And I wanted to remind you that these are the sort of main changes within the standards of proficiency, and these are the sort of key parts of the events that we're running. We've, we've already done one on equality, diverse, diversity and inclusion. Um, we're going to do one on service user involvement. I'm doing one on fitness to practice and mental health. I'm doing one next week on technology and digital skills, and we've got one on leadership. So we hope we're covering the main changes within the standards of proficiency. So you're really clear about those and what they mean for you as registrants. So um, the previous standards, um, they were there. We had them for quite a few years, about five years. So that was that was fine, but they were really 
less about the registrant and their health, and they were really focused on fitness to practice. So we've changed the emphasis of the wording in those standards, and now it reflect, it's reflecting our position, which is one of our aims of um, one of our corporate aims um, as um, a regulator is to be a compassionate regulator. And we really wanted to sort of highlight the focus and the centrality of registrants wellness and that's really what today is about looking at registrants wellness and how your responsibilities to maintain all our responsibilities to maintain our own health and well-being and health and wellness so new expectations in the standards of proficiency this is a new duty for registrants so it's a fairly new way of writing um it was always there before because we always talked about maintaining our own fitness to practice but we didn't specifically say that we all have responsibilities main for maintaining our own health and well-being but it impacts on our ability to practice safely and effectively uh, there's no set way for us to 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 meet this standards and we now expect us as registrants to proactively manage our mental health okay so this is the new standard. And I think it's really nice to sort of um, have the two really clearly. So in the current standards, as they were a couple of months ago, it talked about understanding the importance of maintaining our own health. But in the new standards, we've really beefed this up quite a lot. And it's looking at the importance of maintaining own mental, mental and physical health and well-being strategies to then maintain our own fitness to practice. So it's linking mental and physical health to maintaining our own fitness to practice. So I think it's quite an important um, it's an important change, a really important change for the profession um, and for you as registrants, it enables you to use these standards um, at work. So it, it, it's great. And I'll talk about that in a bit, if that's all right. So we thought we'd use a case study because it's always really nice to actually use a case study to illustrate the points, isn't it, really? So I'll let you just read that for a second. So a social media type complaint, and I, I know from speaking to Anne that sometimes she knows that registrants do get into difficulties with social media. Um, she's nodding her head. I know she'll talk in a second. Um, and, you know, this is something that can happen. Um, and it's important that we look and think about the impact that this has on the reputation of the public, isn't it really? And bringing the profession into disrepute and bringing indeed the the trust or the, the trust that this that Adiola works in into disrepute as well. So Adiola was uh, seen and she was in, had the investigation. I'll let you just read that for a second and I might just take two minutes to log on, but I'll see how I get on. So let me read about that. So Anne Adiola, she apologised profusely. She recognises how serious it is for the trust and profession and she removes the tweets. So she knows, you know, she shouldn't, you know, her son was obviously picked up her phone, did some inappropriate stuff. And she's got insight. She knows what she's done wrong. She's apologised. She recognised the impact it has on the trust. But obviously, any of us can think about the sort of nauseous feeling that we would be having during this investigation, and um, and and how awful that was, how awful that could be. And Anne, I'm going to come to you if that's all right, Anne, because I know that um, yes. you know you can identify because you do have members phoning up about in situations such as this, and also yes. you can also recognise that how this might make Adiola feel and how horrendous she might actually feel. Uh, in mm -hmm. this situation um, and I thought I'd go you know you I know have members saying should you self-refer to the HCPC yes. and I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight standard 9.5 which is obviously mm -hmm. the HCPC standards and I know that you um, highlight those as well yes. um, and clearly if you go through those standard 9.5 and go through each of those points you know it clearly says there that Adiola doesn't need to self-refer to the ACPC because she hasn't got a caution, she mm. hasn't got, um, hasn't had another organisation responsible taking action, and she hasn't had any restrictions based on her based on her practice. But I know that she will probably still phone you, and I know that you know you yes. often refer to our health and character guidance. Um, yes. So, what are your thoughts in this situation, yeah. Anne? So, hi everybody. So, I really like the health and character guidance because it it really helps to frame. The HCPC's position and many people aren't aware of this as guidance from HCPC so it comes into kind of three areas really so people who either are already on the register and they may develop um, a health condition which they're they're very worried about they're very anxious about and they're not sure whether they should let the HCPC know or it's people who when they're due to re-register they may have developed a, again a health condition and they're not sure whether to tell HCPC or brand new qualified people who are just about to register. And sometimes they've declared a health condition or a disability where they didn't need to. 
so kind of from from my point of view um and people are always like kind of really reassured to hear this so hcpc doesn't need to hear about any kind of health condition or disability if it doesn't affect our practice at all so if um if you're able to limit your practice or stop practicing for a period of time that's absolutely fine and we've all got kind of responsibility to do that as hcpc registrant the only time we should let the HCPC know is if we can't adapt our practice or we don't stop practicing and it's potentially affecting the people that we that we serve that we treat um, and sometimes that can be due maybe to understandable anxiety or you know desperately trying to cope with the situation or it might be that somebody's manager or colleague has noticed that the person's really struggling and then potentially there's a knock-on effect for the people that we that we work with um, and I just want to talk briefly so personally, so I'm a HCPC registrant, a registered occupational therapist. And about three years ago, I had very severe depression and anxiety. And this health and guidance character was really helpful to me because I knew, and I was very, very fortunate because I was working at the Royal College of Occupational Therapists at the time with a fantastic bunch of people. So I was really supported and I fully appreciate that lots of people sadly are not in that position. But because I was aware of the health and character guidance, I was able to, for a period of time, stop practicing because I was not well enough and I couldn't do my job properly. And I couldn't I couldn't kind of you know serve our members and, and you know, be able to to help them because my job is all about helping people in emotional support. And I just wasn't up to it at that point. And then when I was kind of on the road to recovery, I was able to to do it in a graded way. So, for example, I spent a lot of time you know, speaking to people on the phone. So there were some days where I just wasn't up to it. I couldn't do it. So, you know, um, work was brilliant. We were able to have a rotor. So I had support with the phone. And then over time, I was able to kind of go back into kind of my normal way of working. But that's just kind of a personal example of being able to either stop and adjust practice for a period of time. And I didn't have to self-report to HCPC. And I think that's really reassuring, Anne, isn't it? And thanks ever so much for telling us about your personal okay. um, your personal story, because that's 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 very generous of you. Um, but it really does illustrate, doesn't it, how you you're able to adapt your practice. And, and it's so nice to hear that your employer was helped yeah. you facilitate that, but that you had the insight to. Mm. to and, and, and what was it like telling them when you first told them? The employers? Yes. What was well, it first? Yeah, um, it was just really obvious because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't myself and just really quiet and I'm not, I'm not normally quiet. <laughs> so if I go really quiet, it's always like something to worry about. So yeah, just, just kind of, you know, go inside yourself. Um, yeah. But what happens and, and a few occasions, well, not a few occasions, but when our members have contacted me about health condition or maybe they've already told the HCPC about a condition where they didn't actually need to, according to the guidance, um, then HCPs, you just need to explain, you know, a phone call or send an email, and then and then they were they were um, fully able to help and say, no, we don't need to investigate this. It's not a fit, fitness to practice concern because you're able to adapt or stop practicing. Yeah. So I think, and for me also, there's a message there about speaking to your professional body, isn't there? Yes. Do, do you know yeah. what I mean? Because yeah. you know the guidance off by heart. You probably know it better yeah. than I do. <laughs> uh, do you know what I mean? The, the fact that you know exactly the situations, um, and you've also yeah. heard these situations before, yeah. many times. Yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, thanks ever so much, Anne. That's that's brilliant. Yeah. Thanks ever so much for sort of reconfirming that point that is in our health and character guidance, but. The personal story really brings it to life, doesn't it? It makes you really appreciate that if you didn't need to, then other yeah. people don't need to, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's really important because we know, don't we, that any referral to fitness to practice at the HCPC would be incredibly layering on even more stress and anxiety exactly. to and already, you know. Very much so. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Anne. That's really, really nice. Thanks for sharing. And, and Jane's already written in, in chat. Thank Thanks you, for sharing, Anne. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. That's really nice. Um, so Anne's going to um, talk in a bit about the support that the college can give you. But this situation of Adiola's develops, unfortunately. And she, as we said, found it quite stressful. She's had issues at home with her, her son. I'll let you just read the next bit. And things got a lot worse for her. And now you're layering on another um, awful experience for Adiola, where she's, you know, thinking she's experiencing thoughts of suicide. And 
I'm going to bring you in, Joe, here, because again, you were health and wellbeing um, expert, um, and I know that you've been talking a lot about mental health uh, at the emergency services uh, conference um, over the last day or so. Uh, and I know that again, uh, Adiola is going to be worried, isn't she, about wanting to self-refer to the HCPC and how also indeed how to tell her employer even that this is how she's actually feeling. Uh, and um, I'm going to flash this slide up because the HCPC and the College of Paramedics were really instrumental in working with the HCPC to develop our guidance on suicide ideation. And it, it sort of adds on to the health and character guidance, doesn't it, really? It's sort of like an add-add on. Um, and I'm wondering, Joe, in this situation, uh, you will have had members um, phoning you in, in dire situations um, and uh, wondered what you would actually say to them. Yeah, um, can I just check that you can hear me OK? We can, it keeps cutting out. You can, oh good, yeah. it keeps freezing. Um, so yeah, if Adiola is finding herself in this position, we'd really encourage her to use this framework that, that's shown on the screen now, um, which makes it really simple and easy to, to follow and to see whether you need to do a referral or not. Um, so literally, um, you have to think about, does her health condition impact her ability to practice safely? Um, you get the three answers there of yes, no, and I'm sure. And as you follow the um, diagram down, it will then um, sort of lead you to what you need to do next. So you yeah. say we, yeah, we developed this jointly. Him. Yeah, you did. And I think the nice thing about, um, and I know that my colleagues will put um, the link in chat because actually there's a really good case study, Joe, isn't there? In the, um, that, yeah, I know you were right. involved in developing it as well, which clearly talks about the process of this situation and what you would advise Adiola to do, um, the support that she could get. And actually, really, the most important thing is that wherever a registrant has a health concern, the HCPC, we really you know, are really clear about this. We want registrants to seek and follow advice from a relevant health professional and follow the policies of their employers, but not be concerned about referral to the HCPC and get some get some sort of support from professional body, your employer, your colleagues. Um, and there's a wealth of um, information on a variety of places, I know, and we're only going to touch on a few of them at the moment, but it's really important that registrants are maintaining that they're able to seek that support for their physical and mental health. And we don't want the HCPC to be a, a barrier to you seeking support and being worried about um, worried about what's going on. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to that, Joe, before we move on to the next bit? Can I say something? Yes, and Jen, do. Sorry, Joe, do you want to say anything? No, you go ahead. No. Oh, cool. Thanks, um, no, I just wanted to say as well. So, um, yeah, you know, sometimes people do do contact and you know in a very in a very desperate state and they've taken the kind of the big step to con to, to speak to somebody about it and a, a very much it's about because you know when you're in that situation yourself you can't see the woods for the trees and it just feels so huge and overwhelming and it's all about taking that initial step and, and a lot of lot of kind of my role and Joe's role and kind of a lot of people in other professional bodies it's about trying to take some of that load off and trying just to unpick unpick you know take try to reduce it into stages and steps and to share as much as you can take some take some of the pressure off and trying to instill some hope because again when you're in there you can't hear it you can't really you can't really accept it but it's trying to do that reassurance and to help it they then they are going to feel like this forever even though it feels like they are and just yeah try as much as possible to to kind of do it as a partnership and teamwork and again and have HCPC there because obviously they're there and they are regulated and they're extremely important and us being able to deliver a safe service to the people that we that we treat is is our number one priority but it's um it's just so important to to reach out if you need if you need you know need that that help thanks so much Anne. um and there's there's a question and i'm wondering I think um, there's a there's a couple of comments in chat saying thank you very much again. I'm um, saying it's really made it clear, but I'm going to um, ask you about records. So uh, it's asking how do HCP, HCPC record contact or is it anonymous or what, what records are kept? I'm, I'm thinking, Simon, you probably mean when the person phones the professional body um, rather than the HCPC. So we're talking about you phoning the professional body first and talking to them. And so 
what what about the contact um can it be so, anonymous can people phone up as you know so, phoning for a friend you know yeah so people can it doesn't happen very often but pe people can because sometimes people just need to do that initial contact and then when it but often when we when we stop talking and explain kind of my role in about pcpc and unison for, for us you know if the people remember then very often they will be able to um to give more details but there's no pressure but what we do because most people would um would be happy to say who they are and because we're a, a member benefit and a member organization strictly speaking they'd have to be a member to receive support but i don't turn people they're not a member i don't turn them away we still have a conversation and i will sign post people but we have we have a, a database a secure database on all our members so after um i've spoken with somebody or if it's a phone call or an email that get put, gets put on a person's record but it's not it's not kind of full details it's not it, cause, and nobody else nobody else will see it but it's just kind of um it's proof that we've had that contact and that also i'm meeting my requirements as a hcpc registrant that i need to 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 keep records but it's very much um very much kind of a need to know very yeah. obviously gdpr is very safe so i wouldn't go into great details of what somebody has told me i personally because people don't need to, to know that that's thanks and that's really reassuring and um they've the Simon thank you has followed up with also that's the same at the ACPC. Um, you can phone us um, and not say your name, but um, if you do say your name, it will we will obviously link it to your record exactly the same, but it's all password protected. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's that's all fairly straightforward. The next part of the standard proficiency that's changed or at, has an addition to it is that we all as registrants have um, to develop and adopt clear strategies for mental and physical self-care and self-awareness. So I was thinking again, there is a, um, a gambit of well-being strategies that we can all access. It's choosing something that's right for us as an individual, isn't it really? Um, and thinking about that's a new standard, so something that's, that's actually new. Um, and I think, again, this gives registrants a bit of power to say that I need to have access to some well-being strategies um, at work or allied to work to support me in, in the work that I to make sure that I'm fit to practice. Um, and we also talk about registrants designing their own wellness goals. Um, and I think that it's really useful here to point out that quite a lot of the professional bodies have a lot of stuff about wellness goals. And I'm going to signpost a couple there. We've, we're lucky enough to have two um, professional bodies represented, Anne and Joe, today. But I also wanted to highlight, highlight um, the British Association of Prosthetics and Orthoptists. And um, they also have an um, amazing, just pick them out, but they have an amazing, their, one of their colleagues, Gemma, um, gave me this information to say that they've also got a huge amount on stress, burnout, maintaining health and well-being. So I think, you know, it's another example really of a, of a professional body and what you've got. And I know uh, that, Anne, you've got some really good stuff on your website on health and well-being. Um, did you write it, Anne, or were you involved in bringing it all together? I was, in, I was involved in, in, mm. in, I mean, we need to do more. And I mean, I, there, are, there is more I'm going to, going to do as well. Yeah. And so what have you got here, Anne? What's okay. that's useful? Now, just to say, to, no problem, just to say to everybody, you're going to think these are flipping obvious and they are obvious, but we, and I'm the biggest hypocrite in the world because a lot of these I don't do, but it's about giving us ourselves permission to look at these and to do as much as we can. Because obviously, if we don't look after ourselves, it's really difficult to look after and to help the people that we support. So forgive me if uh, when I read through this and you think this is really obvious because it's, the, the most important point is that we need to try to do these. OK, so the first one is and as an occupational therapist, I'm going to say this, so kind of establishing a daily routine. So obviously, if you're if you're in work, um, whether you're working from home or you're working in an office, we generally have routine kind of thrust upon us, don't we? So you have your meetings, you have your appointments with your, with your clients, wherever it is. But it's important to, again, hypocrite alert, important to have lunch, important to take a break throughout the day, important to try to go to bed at, at roughly the same time each day. It's important to eat well and drink plenty of water. Because again, because now obviously I don't work clinically as I used to, but when, when I was working in the community, you'd just be you know, full, bam, 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 working, working, working all the time and grab a bit of water if you can, sometimes miss lunch. And sometimes it's only when a colleague so hang on a minute, you need to need to slow down a bit, you need to stop. So it'd be good if we can look out for each other as well and not be afraid to flag that up. Um, staying active. 
I need to do more of this. But luckily, I've got two dogs recently, so that's that's helping for me to do that. So obviously, physical activity does help to reduce our stress levels and increase energy levels. I hope so anyway. Um, so it's good to do that. Good sleep hygiene. So obviously trying to avoid coffee, uh, being on the phone in bed. Again, I do that all the time. Um, be important in the evening, try to have a routine that you can try and unwind um, as much as you can with whatever's going on at home. Stay connected with friends and family because um, it's very it's very easy to become isolated or and even if you live with a group of people, it can feel very lonely at times. So it's important to to reach out and feel some connection with others. Try to focus on what you have control over because and if you're particularly like an anxious person, like I can be at times, you can always always thinking about things and you're worrying. It's all about trying to and I say this a lot to people who you kind of contact our service. We can only control what we could control. We can only meet the other person, you know, in the middle 50 percent. So it's about giving ourselves permission to recognize that. Um, unwind and relax. So make sure that we find some time during the day to do something that helps us to relax. And it can be anything. I mean, I'm I'm useless to do relaxation and things like that. I just can't. It doesn't work for me, but I absolutely love like listening to Audible, you know, kind of, um, comedy and stand up routines on Audible. Um, that really helps to relax me and really chills me out. So kind of whatever floats your boat, really. Um, slow down. So it's important to try and have some time to not to feel like I have to do something all the time, just to sit sit down at some point during the day and just, you know, go out in, in the garden if you have one or walk from the block, just something for yourself. Try to create some time for yourself, some me time. Um, and again, I know if you've got a particularly busy family life, you've got a lot going on, it's very difficult to do, but just try to. Try to do something that's for you or something that you enjoy or just, you know, stop thinking about other people all the time so much. Just try to do that, something for yourself. Then again, and I'm sure you all do this all the time, do something for somebody else outside of, of, of the work setting. So it's it's that kind of reciprocal rewarding feeling of helping other people. But I'm sure you will do that anyway. And then the last thing is about meaning and purpose. So often when there, if there are kind of difficult things going on in our life or work is particularly stressful, Sometimes you kind of think, well, why am, why am I bothering or why am I doing this or what's going on? So it's important to try and take some time to reflect and to think about what's important to us and how are we spending our time? You know, are we sleeping properly? Are we eating properly? How, what would we really like to do and how can we change things? And also we're, we're kind of all of us kind of brought up not to be selfish, not to think of ourselves too much. But it's actually good to be selfish now and again and to do something that you really want to do. So I would just to try and reinforce that and think about, you know, looking after ourselves and our own health and well-being so we'll be more able to support others. And I want you all to try and do at least one of these now, please, within the next few days. Well, <laughs> and I will as well. Anne. Yeah, that's a challenge, Anne. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Do you know, they're not. Whilst they might seem really obvious, probably something my my mum would say to me, just take some time, stop rushing about. Yeah. Actually, you need to hear it from other people, don't you? Yeah, you, you need do. to hear yeah. it. Give permission. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for that. Thank you. And um, I'm I'm going to hand on to to you, Joe. I know you probably wanted to oh, comment on you. that. Yeah. Yeah, I do actually. Um, that's great. That was such a good list. Um, such a a, a really good. Um, such important points that you're raising. I just wanted to add in um, from paramedics' point of view and anyone shifts sometimes it can be really difficult to uh, manage your sleep um, but there is still ways that you can have that kind of routine so you know that when you're going on tonight that you're going to do x y and z before you go to work maybe have a rest and then when you're on nights is um, making sure that you get enough enough rest between shifts and enough downtime to sleep and I know that can be really, really difficult because I'm still an active paramedic. So I, I really do get that. But it's about trying to create some kind of routine that fits in with your work. And so just going on to um, 
sort of recognising how, how you're feeling and how you're doing. Um, we at the um, College of Paramedics in association with the Association of Ambulance Chief Executives came up with this mental health continuum. And this was um, sort of put together by myself and two colleagues who were leading on this project, but we also had a number of other people feeding into this from various different um, organisations. And we also looked at a wide range of published evidence and uh, unpublished evidence as well um, internationally um, to see what, what we could come up with in terms of how you could look at your own mental health. So we found from looking at all these studies across the world, that actually there's roughly around four different categories that we tend to fall into, um, as you can see on the screen here. So we've got thriving, surviving, struggling and in crisis. And if we just go on to the next slide. Um, so what you'll see, if, if you go onto our website at the college, um, there's actually a link to this, or if you Google um, a A C A A C E. Sorry, my just dropped. Oh, poor Joe. We can definitely still hear you a bit, Joe. I'm back again. Yes, you are. You're there, Joe. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. We can. <laughs> Sorry, it keeps dropping out. Yeah, um, so yeah, call. if you go back onto the website, the College of Paramedics website, or the AACE website and search for mental health continuum, this will come up. And what's actually missing between the last slide and this one is a list of um, how you might feel if you were struggling, surviving or in, you know, in crisis. Um, and then at the bottom of that, that chart is are these what you're seeing on the screen now. And it's about um, how you can, can look after yourself, basically, and, and look after your own well-being. So um, really links into what Anne was saying. So um, if you were um, Sort of thriving is about connecting with others, being physically active, um, sort of to maintain your well-being. But if you may be struggling or you know you're starting to find things a bit difficult, maybe it's about using your coping technique. Oh, she's finally gone. I think she was trying so hard. I think poor Joe, <laughs> bless. But she said her main messages and. Oh, there she is. She's back again, Joe. You just literally went, bless you. Um, I know you're you're really struggling there. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, it's fine. No, it's fine. Yeah, it's I'm gonna, some things on the screen I'm, there that you could do. Yeah. I think we'd best leave it at that. <laughs> no problem, Joe. Really want to thank you in case, in case we lose you now, yeah. but thank you very much for your, your contribution. But I'm also going to highlight your wellbeing app, which I think is really useful as well. And I'm also going to ask people in chat to challenge is a lot of people have started to do this already, um, but use the last sort of 10 minutes to pop any resources that you know of that are particularly relevant for registrants. People have mentioned wellbeing champions, people have put different um, different resources in chat, which I've really enjoyed looking at. So the challenge really is for you to start sharing in chat if that would be that would be super useful if you don't mind. While we Joe, just a quick question, can they access the app if they're not a paramedic? Um, no, you unfortunately you do have to be a full member. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to quickly, while we just, while I'm going to challenge you to put things in chat, I'm going to go to this one question that I'm going to ask you in polling. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else, but this one would be really useful. And I'm going to pop the polling app back in chat, if you don't mind, um, to just let me know who's here today in the room. Uh, it would have been nice to know if my my um, phone hadn't logged out, wouldn't it? Would have been nice to know before. Um, and the, and the the event code is wellbeing too. That'd be really helpful. Thank you. Just really nice for us. And I can see that people are starting to put stuff in. Um, Paula's put about um, TASC. I'm sorry, I should know what TASC is and I don't. Uh, if you, Paula, if you wouldn't mind just popping that um, acronym properly for me, that would be super useful. Um, that would be really nice. So, and lots of people are putting things about neurodiversity in the chat and other tools used by speech and language therapists during supervision. So it's really nice. Patrick, is there any questions? I've, I've answered quite a few as we've been going through. People are putting loads of stuff in chat now, which is fantastic. But are there any questions that I haven't really answered that are coming up? I'm just scrolling up chat to make sure why people are just using this um, Slido to mention. Somebody, Rachel's asked, is there an explanation that international registrants get onto the register will refer to and provide evidence on wellbeing in their applications? Um, 
the standard proficiency aren't coming into effect until September 2023 next year. So you won't need, to, if you were an international registrant, for example, and you were applying for registration, or indeed if you are called for a CPD audit, uh, it would be nice, wouldn't it, if you um, included information about how you maintain your own well-being in your CPD and if you were called for an audit. But at the moment, it's not actually implemented until September last September next year. So these uh, webinars are really about getting you ready for those things, if, if that's OK. So thanks ever so much. Lots of people have put their professions and it's just super useful for me. And I can see Anne, there's lots of occupational therapists uh, with us today Yay. and not many paramedics, but I think maybe they're at the, the show, Joe. So that's all OK. Brilliant. So. Thanks ever so much for that. So um, a few other Sorry, Patrick, I'm going to come to you for any questions before we go on to other resources. Is there um, any questions that I've not picked up? I think you sort of just answered it, Kim, but there was a question about uh, documenting this well-being and things like that. And I think you've just sort of touched on that about the fact that you would sort of need to show it if you were called for CPD audit. Is that correct? Yes. That's yeah. a, if you're um, called by when the changes come in, yes. Just, just another thing. Um, I have a feeling that we might have missed some other questions, so uh, apologies if we have. Please just email us um, if you have any questions about the new standards and we can pass this on to policy or we might be able to answer it ourselves as well. Thank you. Yeah. Can I say as well, the professional Go bodies, on, sorry, professional bodies, so we're very much involved in planning for when the, the standards come in next yeah. year, so we'll have lots of information. You can ring us for advice as well about it. Yeah, very important. Fiona, is there anything you'd like to add as a registrant as well? Hi everyone. Um, I just I noted uh, noticed a couple of comments from Dr. Emma Taylor in the chat that I thought might be quite useful to get your perspective on. And the chat is so busy, and there's such a great community here of resource sharing and really, really, really on point questions about you know uh, various aspects of well-being and neurodiversity. I see is featuring as well, which is yeah. an interest of mine. But Dr. M Emma Taylor has asked a couple of questions or made a couple of comments about whether HTPC, for example, would take into account if someone had stepped back from work, but where something might have happened if you like in their home life that might then lead to HCPC referral and particularly um I think there was an ex sorry sorry Emma there was an example that you'd given there but it was really acknowledgement of the fact that um that sometimes the wait for mental health support in the in wow. the National Health Service can be very lengthy and whether really the HCPC position on that. Yeah I think the most important thing for me is that where registrants are seeking support and taking professional advice. And we, I, I thought I read that half read that um, question, sorry about waiting lists. And I thought it was related to the context we're working in. And where if you've got worries about your referred to fitness practice, people are very worried about working in very stressful environments in the context of working. So apologies, I answered that question completely wrongly. Um, but certainly, uh, yes, what, what, what we're and what the professional bodies would say, and that's partly what this is all about, is that registrants are, are, are seeking support and getting professional advice. Joe, and can I come to you for that as well? Would you also? Yeah, because the, the, the whole thing about you know, fitness to practice and when we're struggling, it's about having that, having that insight and then showing that we're doing what we can to still yeah. meet the requirements of, of registration, but also that we don't have to struggle with it Kind of on your own so yeah it's just and it's not you don't have to like provide loads of evidence or something because if you're working in conjunction with a particular professional body then we can go through all, go through all that it's it's the, the worst thing is when people understandably sometimes people just can't it's too much and they don't want to they're not able to face it but obviously things just build up build up over time so it's all about trying to take that deep breath and just contact for example your professional body and then we can try and take some of that weight off. Nice, that's a really nice thing to say. And weight off, Joe. I know you wanted to say something as well. Yeah, it's to follow on from what Anne said, really, you know, if any of our um, members want to contact us, that's absolutely fine. We're happy to help and support. And also within um, College of Paramedics, we have access to uh, legal assistants as well, who, who also do give advice 
on, on these sorts of things. And I've just popped in the chat, actually, um, the NHS professionals, clinicians yes. can access a NHS practitioner health, which is a NHS service specifically yeah. for healthcare professionals. And they offer psychological and some some level of psychiatric support as well. Um, so if you Google them, that, that will come up and give you all the information. I think sometimes um, the support that you can access may be quicker through alternative routes. So, for example, um, employer assist programmes may be quicker than your GP. It's all about navigating that path through and finding the person who can walk alongside you. And I think from what I'm hearing, the professional bodies generally are people who can walk alongside you with that journey. And that, that, that for me would give me great support and help. A couple of really, after changing the topic from, and, and I'm realising in chat, there's some incredible things going on in chat. So I'm going to run through a couple of slides, really. I'm going to plug our sessions again. Please do sign up for them. We are very, we want, you know, we work with colleagues to, who are experts like Anne and, and Joe to develop materials that might be useful to you. I know there's quite lots of questions in chat. We will send you an email after the event with the slides. I would like you to use the slides with your teams. So, you know, generate, generate, use the time slides with your teams, use them to present the new standards of proficiency. So yeah, very, very, very important. And finally, a really wonderful um, survey that if you could possibly complete, we would find this super useful because um, it's really nice to hear and also to hear your thoughts um, about particularly about being joined by um, Anne and Joe and their their expertise really that they've provided for today because I think it's, it's really really been invaluable. So I'm putting the um, the I'm going to get my words out the link in chat uh, and putting even the uh, the QR code in chat. But if you could just spend the last few minutes just while we're chatting, um, doing that that would be really helpful. We have finished the webinar now um, because it is quarter. You know, the time has gone and I'm going to flash up the slides of Joe and Anne's co contact details and my contact details but I really wanted to finish on this slide and, and Anne and Joe if you could pop, possibly pop in chat your your emails that would be really useful because you know what it's like the chat will will stay on people's computers for a few days so it's actually quite useful that you've got your details but in the follow-up email I'll make sure that people have got all your details uh, if they want to they want to con contact you but I want to end with a, a massive thank you um to Anne and Joe, and if we haven't got to any of the questions, I am sorry, um, but please do send them to us. Um, and what we're going to also do is um, from the chat, the resources that you've provided in chat, I'll also put in a document and send that out as well, um, because I think some of the resources that people have put out have been really, really super useful. So a massive thank you, particularly um, uh, Joe, uh, coping with the internet problems mm. and I uh, hope that you enjoy the rest of the show. It sounds very exciting. Um, and Anne, thank you also for, you know, being brave and well, I think it's brave to share your personal um, stories. It, it It's super, super helpful and has, and has really provided a, a sort of unique perspective on what people can go through um, yeah, and, thank some, you. you know, but how, how to cope in those situations with the support of friends, family and professional bodies and colleagues and employers at work. Yeah, lovely. Well, thank you very much for your time and energy and stay safe, everybody, and I hope the rest of the, your day is OK. Really appreciate you joining us today. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Joe. -bye. Bye -bye.